to COVID-19. This is not a complete list and uh, the details are constantly evolving. And so you want to use this list as a jumping off place, not as the last stop to decision making. I also want to make it clear you can call me, text me anytime, 617-872-8921. If you call in the next 30 minutes, I am going to send you to voicemail. Uh, if you send me a text, we may be able to approach it in the Q&A section that we will have later. Uh, so again, I want to run through some things and uh, really, really encourage you to think of them as, uh, as a starting spot, not as uh, the end-all, be-all. And remember that things are constantly evolving. So uh, nearly all departments in state government and indeed municipal government have reduced work schedules and reduced requirements for the general public. Uh, the intention is that personnel who are not immediately responding to COVID-19 should also be staying at home and limiting interactions. Uh, some agencies are able to do more work from home than others. And uh, so before you do anything that involves a state agency, you're going to want to go ahead and call that agency and confirm that the thing that uh, you're setting out to do is even required at this time. Um, perhaps it can be done electronically over the telephone, in which case that's the preferred way, so on and so forth. That applies really across the board. Uh, as you likely know, all K through 12 schools across the Commonwealth are closed up through and including April 6. That, to be clear, does not require colleges and universities to close, although very many of them uh, have pushed the students off campus and switched to distance learning for the entire semester. That also does not include special education schools, either residential or day schools. Those are being handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Restaurants uh, statewide are takeout or delivery only. Here in Brookline, the town has created a number of metered parking spaces that are now 15-minute parking. Uh, specifically with the idea that folks who are picking up takeaway food or uh, delivery employees who are going to pull in, load up, and drive away again will have additional spaces to park. And so in all of the commercial districts, I hope you will be on the lookout for these spaces. Uh, use them if you are running in and out for restaurant pickup, but otherwise keep those spaces clear. On that note, um, some parking rules are different in Brookline right now, and I do not know when this, these, these changes will expire, but, but FYI, you do not have to pay a meter. You do not have to obey the two-hour parking maximum, and you do not have to obey the overnight parking ban. You do have to continue obeying rules around handicap parking, rules around fire hydrants. You still may not park in the bicycle lane or otherwise in a place where uh, you shouldn't be parking, um, so on and so forth. And so, so that's some, some, some information on parking, restaurant, takeout, and delivery. Um, for those who are currently unemployed, uh, or for those uh, employers who are trying to do right by your employees, there are several changes in the rules surrounding unemployment that we hope will make it easier for people to more quickly and effectively get some unemployment benefits. Uh, for example, there used to be a one week waiting period that has been waived. And so uh, the moment you, uh, the moment you are uh, no longer employed, you can begin this process and hopefully get those benefits as quickly as possible. Additionally, um, the current rules for unemployment would require uh, the person collecting unemployment to attend in-person trainings and classes. Those have been waived for obvious reasons and uh, almost all unemployment business is being handled by telephone. Um, gatherings across the state are limited to 25 people. That includes shopping, worshiping, socializing, working, uh, really uh, all spaces indoor and out. And it's really important uh, that this be respected Obviously, there are exceptions in medical facilities and in grocery stores. Um, but there again, you still want to do everything you can to maintain that six-foot social distance. Um, I understand uh, 
Dr. Baton is somewhere on this conference call. We're going to see if we can connect him. Uh, hold tight, and I'll continue while we're working on that. Uh, the Department of Public Utilities has put out a moratorium on gas and electric disconnects. My understanding is not only will they not turn your uh, gas or electric off, but that um, if you currently have a bill in arrears, that the collection process will not begin either. Um, do, do pay your bill if you are able, but know that if you are not, um, this is not a time for folks to, to lose their utilities. Uh, the RMV has extended most license renewal periods, is not currently offering driver's tests, uh, in-person driver's tests. And in general, if there's any business that you can do electronically or over the telephone, they are requiring that you do that for the time being. Um, and so maybe the only thing worse than going to the RMV and waiting online is calling them on the phone, but I'm encouraging you to do that. Um, you may find if you go there, they will turn you away. Uh, it's all up in the air. You always want to over communicate and really try to uh, communicate from your home first. There's a $10 million small business loan that has been made available, up to $75,000, both available to businesses and nonprofits. Um, that may be uh, useful for some folks. None of these things are, are, are going to solve everybody's problems, all of everybody's problems, but to the extent that we can um, be helpful, we will. Um, Additionally, uh, restaurants and hotels or B&Bs that must pay a meals tax or a lodging tax, um, that payment in theory was due, uh, will be due tomorrow, but in fact, the February, March, and April, uh, excuse me, March, April, and May payments are now due at the end of June. They're still due but there will be no interest and no penalties assessed you have until the end of June. And that should give you a little bit of time to deal with the uh, more immediate costs facing your restaurant or small hotel. That, uh, is, by the way, is limited to 2019 payments of $150,000 or less, which corresponds with $2.4 million in business in the year. Um, any restaurant that you think of as uh, an individual restaurant, not a chain of restaurants will almost certainly qualify for this. Uh, there also have been a long list of changes being made uh, that have been made or that are under consideration uh, regarding how the local government can do its business. So, for example, there have been changes in the open meeting law to allow important business to continue even if people aren't in the same room. Uh, and so we urge patience as our local as our local government gets used to using WebEx uh, and, and Zoom, uh, they don't always get the IT exactly right the first time, but hang, hang tight with them. Uh, everyone is working it out. And hey, we're working it out now. Um, we think that Dr. Asaf is on this conference call, but uh, we haven't I'm been here. able to get him on the sheet yet. Oh, he's here. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I'm so I'm glad you could join us. A list of important announcements to be uh, read off. So uh, I have. Apologize well, that I'm late. Uh, I was just not at all. For my clinical duties. I, we, we forgive you for being a medical person right now. We think that's probably the most important thing uh, that you could be doing. Uh, I'm actually almost done, and then I'm going to cut right over to you. I just wanted to mention that um, there are changes and proposed changes in the fiscal year 21 municipal budget expectations and rules. And that's really important because uh, cities and towns have to have a new budget in place for July 1. Obviously, there's a run-up to that and all kinds of public process that we're having a hard time achieving. And we still want to make sure that the budget is one that works for the community and uh, perhaps maybe a little different in light of COVID-19. And so communities will have the ability to extend that, it looks like. Um, there will also are expected to be changes in the town meeting process. Now, these are really technical changes um, that folks like moderator Sandy Gadsby uh, would find critical, but most of us would find um, pretty dry, nevertheless important. And there are, are rumors, it's not clear yet, but it would not surprise me if municipal elections are delayed. And that's a really big deal and something we should take very seriously. Uh, any monkey business with our democracy uh, is a major problem. At the same time, if people can't participate in elections because of COVID-19, that's also a big problem. So the legislature is working through that. I want to cut over and take a minute 
to introduce uh, my guest, Dr. Baton, and he's got a remarkably long uh, resume and intro, and I'm not going to read all of that, but I am going to hit some highlights. Um, some, some key is that he is both an MD and an MPH. Um, he is an expert on primary care policy and delivery. Um, he's um, got uh, his finger in a lot of pots, including the World Bank, the World Health Organization, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, he's, he's been involved in work throughout Polynesia, Ghana, Costa Rica, Haiti, and Estonia. Uh, this guy has done an awful lot, been involved with Medicare and Medicaid innovation. Um, and in his spare time, I suppose he's also an assistant professor and a Pierce dad. I'm also a Pierce dad, so we've got that in common. Um, what do you think? What should we be thinking about? Um, and maybe you can just sort of give us a few minutes of highlights before we get into some questions. Well, thanks for having me on. And uh, again, apologies for being a little late. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it goes almost without saying that we're in unprecedented times here. And um, certainly in my lifetime, I've never seen uh, a pandemic like this and a, a, a really a social and political response and, and a rapid response with a lot of implications for our health and our economy and our, our social fabric. So. The first is just to acknowledge that these are um, these are wild times, but um, I do believe that really we've seen over the last few days a shift, um, certainly at the state and local level, and I think we're starting to see it at the national level, to confront this head on, to make the necessary changes, uh, difficult choices, and coordinated responses that are gonna get us to where we need to be. Right now, the, the critical matter is the following. We need, we need, we need to socially distance each other um, from ourselves. Uh, we are doing that. I commend state and local legislative bodies for taking this seriously and commend the efforts of all of our residents of our communities to get comfortable with the uncomfortable and that dawning realization that it's gonna be a little while or more than a little while before life gets back to normal, but that if we act now and if we act consistently, we're gonna really be able to flatten the curve. And most importantly, from that perspective, because it's not theoretical, your actions that every person is taking right now um, aren't just uh, you know, going uh, and gonna be forsaken. What they do is they really reduce the burden right now on the healthcare system and they reduce the risk that hospitals will um, surge past capacity and horrible things like what's going on in Italy will happen. So, you know, right now it's about dedication uh, by everyone to do as much as they can um, in this fight together, but also realize that we need to be thinking about our most vulnerable community members and we need to be thinking about their well being. We need to be thinking about small business and economic well being. We need to support infrastructure as it needs to be. So, this is a whole of government, whole of society response to an unprecedented crisis. So, uh, there are two things I want to sort of circle back to. Uh, one is if you can explain a little bit more about what flatten the curve is. You mentioned it briefly, but I think it's so important. We've heard the phrase a lot, and I think a few more sentences would be helpful. And the second thing is, um, if you could help us understand, you know, other than, you know, we've been told, wash our hands really well. I think people are really getting that message. Um, you know, dial soap sales, I'm, I'm sure, are going to be great for the next year or more. Um, and we're hearing, essentially, shelter in place to the extent possible. Um, but surely there are other things we can do that are in between, or, or uh, maybe you could highlight some choices people can make um, that help us flatten the curve um, in our day-to-day -day life. Yeah, so flattening the curve really um, revolves around uh, basically changing the curve of the epidemic, which is right now on track for super steep rise in cases and hospitalizations and bad stuff happening, including deaths. And it's really about taking that steep rise and flattening it out, not only reducing it, reducing its maximal height, but also sort of changing the slope and really extending it out. And the reason that this isn't just theory or math is the following. Our healthcare capacity, even in a place like Eastern Massachusetts is finite. We have some wonderful hospitals. We have a lot of hospital bed capacity, 
but it's only limited to so many beds and so many ventilators and so many staff. All of the projections right now, all of the credible projections suggest that if we don't enact strong and consistent and coordinated policies and actually act upon those policies, that means that every single person do their part in making it happen. All of the projections are that we overwhelm our health system's capacity in three or four weeks. We don't want that to happen. That is a terrible, terrible thing that's horribly unsafe that is going to ask and put all of us in jeopardy and, and we just don't want that. So the answer, if we don't want that, is to do our part to stay apart. That means that we really need to practice a, a distancing of at least six feet. We need to limit our time um, you know, in enclosed places. I, you know, the state regulation is 25. I really think it should be under 10. The smaller, the better. Minimize all but the most important um, trips to markets and pharmacies. But, and this is the hard part, this isn't an order to stay inside. You can still go walk. You should still, if you can, go exercise. You can ride your bike, wear a helmet. There are all these great things you should do. You just got to stay apart from other people and not be with other people outside of your household, um, you know, uh, within six feet. So, so we're asking people to do something really different and really hard, but this is going to pay a dividend and it's going to really um, help us not overwhelm the health system. That's great. And I want to point out that it, part of this flattening the curve is reducing that peak but also it buys us more time to actually increase the health care system's capacity. So for example, some of the things the state is doing, um, we are allowing uh, medical practitioners whose licenses have recently expired, say for example, a nurse uh, retired, you know, gonna hit the golf course, uh, come back to work, we're gonna need your help. Uh, we're allowing medical practitioners who are licensed in other states to work. and incredible care and caution is necessary to make sure that the, these people who are coming on board who have had some time off or are used to working in another place are effective and, and everyone is uh, safe under their care. But things like this, uh, there may be conversations about literally adding, adding beds, finding locations yeah. to add more beds. I, I know of a lot of universities that have empty dormitories right now. That's right. Uh, yeah, and Carney and Hospital has now been designated as a COVID-19 hospital site, and that's fantastic uh, for surge capacity. There are going to be um, many, uh, you know, ingenious uh, innovations that will be needed to, to deal with this, um, with this surge. And as you say, um, the key is buying us some time. And, and it actually works the other way, too, I want to add. So if we practice... Um, consistent, effective uh, social distancing and wash our hands and really stay at home in particular if we're sick, unless it's a crisis and you need to come to the hospital, then what happens is in all both the models and all the other countries' experiences, you actually shorten the time of the, this most significant disruption. So think of this as an investment in getting back to work and getting back to normal life because you know none of us want to be doing this. But I tell you what, if we don't do this well, then, then it gets done involuntarily. You know, you get mandatory quarantines. You're seeing this across other parts of the world. We don't want that to happen and we can do it, but everyone's got to do their part right now. And I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Big Brookline Interactive Group for being flexible and allowing us to appear live on television together, not in the same room, which is exactly the point. Right. Right? We're all working really hard and taking new steps, taking risks, trying new things that are uncomfortable to really, really take this seriously. Uh, and, that's, and that's a real challenge. I've got a, I've got a couple of questions from viewers. Um, I think we can handle them relatively quickly. We don't have much time left. The first question comes from Becky, and she notes that both federal and state restrictions on telemedicine have been eased. Uh, can you explain what that means for people needing medical treatment, either related to COVID-19 or otherwise? It's a great question, Becky, and I was actually doing it this morning. So what it means is that um, two things. Number one, it's making it easier for your healthcare provider team to interact with you in a variety of ways that respect this social distance. We want to minimize 
the number of times that people, including healthcare workers, need to interact with others to uh, physically to the absolute minimum. And it turns out that a lot of good medical care can happen either over the phone or in virtual visits on basically video chats, et cetera. So um, national and state bodies have basically waived often a little bit onerous requirements and even basically said that if a provider, all, all he or she has is FaceTime and they need to make a, a call to check in with the patient instead of having them come in, that's essentially okay for now. Some insurers are actually taking it a step further. You gotta check your insurance plan, but they're saying, we'll, we'll make it equivalent. A face-to-face -face visit is equivalent to a telehealth visit. And that's good, especially for small providers who need to figure out how to stay open and, and see people, but don't have that in-person visit volume. That's great, thank you. And, and, and again, just as I said, you wanna make sure you're checking in with a state or local agency before making a decision. Check in with your healthcare provider Call them on the phone and make sure that, one, this is something you can do. Um, and maybe it's not related to COVID-19, but still to keep that social distancing. And two, make sure that you understand what your insurance payment ramifications are as well. Uh, we just want to make sure that people don't, in trying to do the right thing, find themselves in a difficult situation later. So be aware of all of that. Uh, this next question comes from Ernie, and he asks if the town should consider a campaign to encourage absentee balloting for the upcoming elections. For example, we have an election scheduled for early May in Brookline. Oh, it's a great question. I mean, um, what I would say is it might be a little too early to, um, to know whether this dynamic of intense rise in transmission is gonna still be uh, applicable in early May. I mean, I, I personally think that if we can, it, you know, do all the steps right now, increase testing, practice social distancing, increased capacity at the hospitals, we may be seeing in early to mid-May, uh, you know, uh, the beginnings of a resumption of, of normalcy here. If not, though, then uh, I turn it back to you, Tommy, you know, we may need to consider absentees. Yeah, and I want to point out that um, two things are true. The first thing is that Massachusetts does not have no excuse absentee. You must have a reason to be voting absentee. But the second thing is that Bill Galvin, the Secretary of the Commonwealth, has made absolutely clear that uh, a responsible response to COVID-19 can include using an absentee ballot. And so, at least for the time being, uh, anyone should feel free to use an absentee ballot. Right now, it is, uh, it is legal. It is within um, the rules and regulations put forth by the legislature and Secretary Galvin. Uh, I intend to vote absentee. I, I have never done it before. Actually, that's not true. I once voted in a presidential election in the year 2000 absentee, but, um, but I intend to do the same thing. The third question comes from Hugh, and he asks, can a microwave oven be used to kill the COVID-19 virus? If I buy takeout food and I want to be sure that it's safe, will a microwave oven work? And can I use this in all the food I buy? And how many seconds is enough? Well, uh, not to my knowledge. No, that, that it, it may, may seem theoretically possible, but it is uh, not to my knowledge that um, microwave uh, radiation can kill the COVID virus. So the best, uh, the best bets are to, uh, if at all possible, make the food yourself, keep a clean work surface, uh, use wipes with, um, you know, diluted uh, Clorox or, or other sort of real significant any uh, antiviral and antibacterial properties and and uh unfortunately i don't think the microwave tricks are something i can recommend great and it, and it goes without saying if you are using cleaning products at home um certain cleaning products when mixed are very dangerous so please uh yes. you, use the internet be very careful if you're mixing uh cleaning chemicals together we don't want uh, a situation where you create a chemical reaction you didn't intend for that um that doesn't do you any good that's for a sure great point and if you can find them or order them then the the, the wipes are the best you know great. the antiseptic wipes um janice asks what about stationary or money can the virus be transmitted by u.s mail or on dollar bills Ooh, great question i, I have seen some reports that at least theoretically you know the virus um, can live uh, really on all surfaces. Yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, there was a report that it certainly can live for up, first of all, viruses don't live. It can basically exist in a state that 
uh, can transmit uh, its disease for up to three days on surfaces such as plastic and metal and probably paper. So um, it's a great point. You know, I, I, I do wonder, you know, if, you, if you're at high risk, for instance, um, as the mail comes in, maybe you want to just give it a quick wipe down. Uh, again, we're, we're all developing guidance as we, as we are going through this, but, you know, a, a little bit of caution might, might serve you well. Thank you. And then the last question I got is from Jacob, and he asks, does it make sense to suspend construction activity as the next action? And if not, what should be the next steps, steps that governments take with respect to activity in commerce? Uh, my understanding uh, yesterday is that at least some construction activity was suspended. Um, I'm Boston and Cambridge, I believe. Yeah, uh, I, I think that I think that that would be something for you all to 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 think about. You know, in our local environment too. I mean, there's an aggregation issue of workers. Certainly, any essential construction, anything on medical facilities, etc., needs to continue. But um, we've really got to separate people from each other, and um, and and if we do this now, we can make this short, sharp, and get back to work as soon as possible. Well, and I'm going to go ahead and put in a plug for a bill I filed, HB 4948, which would give municipal government executive branch agents, which is to say mayors and select boards, the authority to add um, business restrictions on operating conditions, on hours, up to including closure above and beyond what the governor has rolled out. Um, I, I am interested in giving local municipalities a little more flexibility to tailor uh, additional constraints. I think it might be worth doing. We are just about out of time. I want to thank Brookline Interactive Group, uh, not just for hosting this episode, but really for being so remarkable in making sure that local government is able to communicate clearly with the members of Brookline in such a challenging time um, our democracy is not to be taken lightly and public health is not to be taken lightly and to try to manage both of them. I think big has been a critical, critical feature. And, and doctor, I want to thank you. I know you're so busy. I know you've done so many of these. Uh, I look forward to, um, to giving you a, maybe first an elbow bump, then a fist bump, then a high five, then a hug, um, you know, back at, back on Pierce go. when our kids are finally uh, going back to school. They're, they're struggling. They're doing the best they can, but it's it's hard for these little ones to be confined at home as well. Uh, my son and I are going to go for a bike ride later today. We'll keep that social distance. We'll get a little exercise, blow a little steam. Um, and once again, really, we really just, it's so important. Shelter in place as much as you can. Maintain that social distance. Do you really need to go out today or could it wait another day or two? Stretch all of that out. Um, and please, everyone, be safe. I'm going to say my phone number and my email again. If you have any questions or anything I can do to help, 617-872-8921 is my cell phone. You call anytime. Tommy.Vitolo at mahouse.gov is my email address. Um, please do everything you can to be safe. And please be supportive of each other and kind to each other. It's stressful and difficult for all of us, and we're going to get through it together. So with that, have a great evening, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.